4. So the book of Acts we've been covering so far is a story, a long narrative of what happened after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus ascends to the heavenly realms, and he is lording over the universe, sends his Holy Spirit for people. And then as the church is um, booming in Jerusalem, the first mega church is born, and they, they it's great for a while. They share resources. They get along. They love each other. And the disciples almost immediately get in trouble. They get fussed at. And after they get fussed at, I, I want to I'm going to start where we ended last week on purpose because I'll make sure you remember what's going on. So in chapter 4, verse 29, if you haven't, say, Amen. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. So this is the prayer of the church. and said, We're going to go to jail if we don't shut up. We're going to go to jail. And the church prays this. Pay attention to their threats and grant your servants to speak your word, the gospel, with boldness, frankness. Help us be bold. Help us be bold, courageous. We're going to go to jail. Stretch out your hand to heal. That is through us. That's a common Old Testament. Stretch out your hand to heal people through us. Through signs and wonders, we call them maybe miracles. Exercise demons, heal people. Do stuff. Perform through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed this, uh, there's an earthquake, which in the Old Testament is a classic example of God showing up. It's God saying, I'm with you. The earth shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the gospel. That's the word of God with boldness. That's what so he answered the prayer. He answered the prayer of speaking boldly. In a second, we're going to see more answer to prayer because he starts healing people what they prayed for. God, we want to be bold to share the gospel. We want you to work through us as your hands and feet. And I said this last time is that, remember, that that boldness as the visible sign of God's presence. The visible. I don't know what came over me. Some came over just to talk about Jesus, and I didn't care what happened to me. That's boldness. And I love that quote, David Cook. I said last week, the Holy Spirit does not empower his people to silence. He just doesn't. And I know, I know, I know, some people are gifted with a gift of evangelism. They're just easier to them than others. I don't have that gift. I have to work at it more. I know people are gifted with that. And I also know that people who are strong introverts is more difficult than maybe an extrovert. I, there are all kinds of idiosyncratic personality distinctions. That's fine. But as a church body. If the Spirit's in you, the Spirit's going to enable you to do the work He wants you to do out in the real world. And that includes talking about Him and the signs. And that is happening around the world. It is happening around the world. Uh, people around the world who are sharing the gospel to new people, they share boldly and incredible things happen. Now in this next section, we're going to see for the first time in a second, a good example and then a bad example. So let's back up just for a second. So the church, is, the church in Jerusalem has been born going well at first people sharing everybody loves them but the first thing that happens next is external attack and that's what we talked about the last couple of weeks they say you've got to stop talking about jesus and be quiet and they threaten them in response to that lord help us speak louder the external pressures hill church will always receive external pressures when we act like jesus maybe not as much as they did because we're surrounded by other people in a culture where christianity is a little more accepted but it's a good sign you're for the kingdom of God if people who are non-Christians can't stand you, stand up for Jesus. We don't want to be, they don't want, we don't want the community to be against us for the wrong reasons, but for the right reasons. And if they can't stand forgiving people and loving people who are unlovable like me and being kind and gracious and helping the home, okay, you're going to be mad. You're going to be mad. That's the way of Jesus. That's the Jesus way we sing. The next thing we learn in Acts is now the external pressure not only is there, now evil starts working inside of the very own church community. So within, quote unquote, no time, there's, there's problems within the church. Now, this is only hypothetical. You, you've never experienced problems in the church. But imagine, that's Christian sarcasm. Imagine for a second. So a lot of times we'll have people go like, you know, I want to be like the New Testament church. What does that mean? Which part? The one that's divided and dirty and at each other's throat? Or the part where they get along all the time? The church is both and. Uh, that doesn't make it good all the time, but it's both. So let's look, now let's see what ne happens next. Okay. This is the third summary statement of, of Luke, of the book of Acts. Third time he says, Now the company of those who believed were of one heart and soul. I like that expression. In, in Greek it is at one heart, one soul. That is, of course, in Hellenistic world, that's a deep sign of friendship. We're deeply bonded. We're in this together. And no one said that any of his things which he possessed was his own. He means only his or her own. But they had everything in common. That is to say, you had everybody had access to the stuff of other people, so there was no needy people. And that's the point. 
that I'm not going to, as it were, be selfish with my material stuff if you need it. Verse 33, and with great power, power is a biblical word. For, it's like God's, God's presence empowers people. That's power, dunamis, dynamite, power. The apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So as they stayed true to that message, God kept empowering to keep preaching. Verse 34, there wasn't one single needy person among them. No one who went to um, Hill Church, Jerusalem, nobody had any physical needs. There were no needs amongst the church. Let that sink in. We'll come back. For as many were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and they brought the proceeds of what was sold uh, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to each as any had need. So here the image is if someone has uh, extra houses, or extra farms, or extra things they don't need, and if there were needy people in the church, they would sell that, get the proceeds, and give it to the apostles. Lay it at their feet. Doesn't necessarily literally. Lay, there's a you know chest of drawers or treasure chest. The point is, we'll give it to the church leaders, and then they know the greatest need inside the church, and they'll disseminate this money, this so that no one's needy. There's no one should be broke. Um, now, here's a great example of someone who did this just right. Verse 36, thus Joseph, or Yosef, all right, you can say that. Uh, that's his real, this is Hebrew name, just like Jesus' earthly father. It's a very common male name in the ancient world for Jews. And he had a nickname by the apostles, Barnabas, which means, okay, it means something like, it can mean son of encouragement. It can also mean, uh, bar, uh, bar means son of. It could be Nabi, which means son of the prophet meaning he's an exhorter or preacher or prophet. Later on in Acts and other documents too, he's actually one who um, he preaches more. And so it might be a sense like son of exhortation. Um, but anyway, the point is they have a nickname. They really either, they're saying he's a really good encouraging guy or they're saying he's a really good exhorter preacher. But he's a Levite. A Levite is of the priestly class. So that's, um, we don't care about Levites these days, but they sure did. So priestly class means he had high uh, social standing in Judaism, and he's a native of Cyprus. Well, so what? Well, a, a Cy person from Cyprus was well known for being wealthy, and that makes sense. The next thing is because he has a farm to sell, verse 37. Your translation might say he sold a field. A good translation is farm, and there might be a farmer in the house who understands what a farm is. So he's a farmer. Now, whether he has the farm in Cyprus or in Israel, we're not told, but he's got some money, and he has at least, at least one farm, and he sells it. And he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so here's the point. So this is, he is, this guy's, uh, will later on be a very important mediator between Paul, uh, later on Paul and the early church. This guy will be very likable and knowable and it's great. He's wealthy. He sells the land, does it just right. Let me pause this for a second because I want to make sure you understand this before we move on to this next really scary story. In the biblical world in Judaism, they believe that if someone's poor a lot, if someone stayed in long-term poverty, it's almost certainly because of an abuse of power. You could be poor because a, a famine came or there was a disaster in your family, but if you were poor for a long period, someone's taking advantage of someone else. Because in the ancient world, like many, many parts of the world today in 2024, they thought of resources like a pie and as a limited pie, a pie. Americans tend not to think that way. We tend to think the sky is a limit, it's unlimited. You can be what you want to be and so forth. But most of the world and certainly everybody in the ancient world, no, it is not. It's limited. So they're always limited. And that's why in Deuteronomy 15 and 11, it says you're always going to have poor in the land. That's why Jesus said that in Mark 14, 7. You'll always have the poor among you. Resources are limited. And because of that, people can't hoard them. So he would say God's people, we would say now Christians, but Jews thought the same thing, Deuteronomy 15, 4, that people who had more of the pie were supposed to share that with the others because it's a limited commodity. And that's a basic assumption in Judaism and Christianity. And so when these people start joining together as a whole community, we don't have any solid examples in this time period. We have one group at Qumran maybe, but Greeks and Romans didn't do this kind of thing. They valued high friendship, one heart, one soul, meant that's a common expression of a good bonded friendship. But for a community of nobodies and Levites and priests and slaves to get together and say, we're all share resources and there's no needy people, no one did that. And this stands out as this very bizarre phenomenon right in the middle of the temple precincts where all the fellow Jews are 
that people from all social strata now care about each other so much. Lee, what happened to your farm? Didn't you used to farm or something? No, I sold it. Why'd you sell it? Man, that thing is gold. You know how much money that made you every year? Yeah, but I had a, three families in my church who needed it. Wait, what? What's a church? I mean, I know what a church is. That uh, we'll see. Church just means uh, an assembly of people. Uh, so this did, and not like capital C church. But so, why did you do that, man? You had that. You had all that land. Would you today? We might say, man, that car, that car was gold. And what was that? Oh, there's a new Tesla model. What? Man, that car is gold. What'd you do to that thing? And I, I, there's some people at church. They were in some dire straits. So I got rid of it. I, I help me understand. I don't compute for me. You did what? How much was in your 401k? What did you do with your property? You had that home in Florida. What did you do to it? Why did you, that was your retirement. You saved up your life for a golf course. Yeah, but I gave my life to Jesus. Who? He made you do that? No, he didn't make me do it. See, in Luke's theology, all through Acts, is that when the Holy Spirit comes inside of a person and they really come inside, like Gary prayed, really fills us up, it changes us desperately how we see each other's physical needs. It means I cannot be part of a family of faith and not care how you're doing. I can't. If you've really been a John 3 vocabulary, born from above, born again, you cannot go into a church family and go, you know, with blinders on. I don't care how my people and the chairs beside me are doing. It, you can't. The Spirit opens this radar inside of us, and we care deeply about that. Now, not everyone's wealthy in relative definition. Not everyone has farms to sell. Not everyone has it granted. And the same thing in the New Testament. They didn't say everybody sold everything they had all the time. It's just when there's a great need arose, that's what happened. That's what the Spirit does. It unites us that way. And that's one thing I love about Hill Church. I'm, I don't know if we do anything perfectly. That's one thing I like about Hill Church. That's not the same as all other churches. Now, it's a competition. But we have, the, usually when I hear about great needs, we can spread the word very quickly through Hill Helps on Facebook. Or we can spread the word, and, and people can rise to the occasion. And there's more we can keep fostering that in our own hearts and minds. But my question before we move on quickly is, really, are other people's needs on your radar? Do you see other people in dire straits, not because they're just simply in, oh, they chose poverty and so forth, but someone who's down and out for something beyond their control, is it on your radar at all? If it is, Luke would say that's a sign of the Spirit. That weirdness of a community that would do that is an incredible sign to our community of what kind of people we are. And I really like this quote by Will Willimon. He's a very well-known pastor in the Methodist tradition. The most eloquent testimony to the reality of the resurrection is not an empty tomb or well-orchestrated pageant on Easter Sunday, but rather a group of people whose life together is so radically different so completely changed from the way the world builds a community that there can be no explanation other than that something decisive that has happened uh, in, in history. It's my type of Something had to have happened to make these people do that. It's weird. Why do you care so much about the people beside you? Because then out there in the world, they don't. You need something. You can rally together to fight against someone. You can do protest marches. You can join groups how much you hate someone else. You have to have a common enemy to unite the troops. And that's the fastest way to unite troops, is have a common enemy. But then you meet these weirdos called Christians. They go to whatever church they go to. But who's your enemy? Well, well evil, Satan, but not you. Then what? how are you rally together like this? Glad you asked. Let me tell you about Jesus. And that's exactly what they did. <laughs> the next section shouldn't be chapter 5. It should be just keep it on chapter 4 because it's the same point. Now, here's a really bad example. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias, uh, Ananias uh, coming from probably Hananiah in Hebrew, means like God is gracious. And his wife, Safira, Safira means beautiful. We know that wealthy Jewish women in the past had that name. Uh, Safira means beautiful. They sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds, and he brought only a part and laid at the apostles' feet. The assumption here is that they would have told him, hey, we got this land, we're going to sell it and give it to the church. And in essence, they embezzled. So they only gave part of what they said, and they kept part for themselves. They just lied. But Peter has this prophetic insight by the Spirit. He meets Peter, Ananias says, 
Why has Satan filled your heart to lie, not to the church, you hear this, but to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Why did, why did you choose to lie? While it remained unsold, did it remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not for your disposal? That is, you had the authority to give us all the money. Why didn't you give it, or why'd you lie, or just don't sell it? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Have you not lied to men but to God? Or you have not lied to men but to God? Verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. We don't know if he fell because he got caught or if God killed him. It just says he fell down and died. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. I would think so. Did you hear about Ananias? Uh, Ananias, yeah, he's dead. Well, he met with the church leadership and he said, I mean, they caught him embezzling. He died on the spot. The young men, look how sterile this sounds. The young men rose and wrapped him, carried him out and buried him. It's over. There's no grieving. There's no mourning. It's over. That's what happens in judgment in the Bible. Verse 7, after an interval, about three hours, his wife comes in wherever she's been, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. This is a chance to come clean is what it is. And she said, well, yeah, yeah, for so much. He knows she's lying. Peter said to her, how is that you have agreed together to test or tempt the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those that have buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out, and they buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church. That's the first time in the book of Acts the word church is used. Um, and upon all who heard of these things. Now, again, church there, uh, ecclesia, it lit I mean, literally means those who are called out. A good translation of church is just assembly, and uh, that's how the Jews would call synagogue too, an assembly of God. The point is all of God's people in the assembly of that group, which we now use the word church from the German Kirche, assembly, they were terrified. Well, this is a bizarre text. That's it. Now, let me say a little more. I've got a few more words on the screen to make sure I'm, I wrestled really hard this week. Because I thought about some jokes like, okay, we're going to try to start seeing. Well, I will tell you that. All right. God treated this Jerusalem church, this Jerusalem church, like a very special community of faith, like he did in the Old Testament. When the Jews got together in front of the temple, for example, if you don't remember this, Achan and Joshua, uh, Achan is a guy, he takes, they said, don't take the plunder after they won a war. He took some plunder and, and he died. God jumps and says, it wasn't your stuff to take. Not in this time, that wasn't your stuff to take. Or, of course, Nadab and Abilu and Leviticus, these were priests, and they did the wrong sacrifice in the sacred place of the temple, and they died. So God is treating this Jerusalem church as this incredibly special, we might say, holy community. We're, we're treating it like it's an Old Testament holy community. The point is not that Ananias and Sapphira were obligated. They weren't obligated to give their property or proceeds. It never says to be in the church in Jerusalem, you've got to give all your stuff. It never says that. They didn't have to. Jesus never says you have to give all your stuff away. They were obligated not to embezzle and to tell the truth to the community. Imagine today, you see this, so we have, if you're not, maybe don't know, crowdfunding is a thing we can, you know, raise money. They're like, we're kind of like crowdfunding for those totes, kind of, <laughs> in a good way. The ones are raising money from the community, right? We can do crowdfunding online and say, I'm raising money for cancer or, or Black Lives Matter. Anyone can raise money for whatever they want. And of course, not long ago, I was reading about an article just the other day, and there was a massive crowdfunding fraud, millions of dollars. They said, we're raising money to buy real estate for some more cannabis weed places, and they took a big chunk of that money. So they said the money was going to go for this, but they did partial, and that was theirs. That's what happened here. These two people, this couple, deliberately hold back on purpose. Now, well, so what? God's judgment here is unique. In the entire New Testament, we're never told again that God, the implication seems to be that God judged them and killed them. We don't take from that, God will always judge and kill a person on the spot we don't tell the truth. Amen? Yeah. I don't know much y'all liars in here, you better be glad about that one. <laughs> God's judgment here is not, it is unique. Now, the one exception may be in 1 Corinthians 11, 29 to 30, if you remember, and that's when Paul says, some of you are taking the model, the Lord's Supper. You're taking it badly. You have a lot of sin in your life. And uh, he said that some of you are eating 
the Lord's Supper with others for the poor people got off of work. I, I preached that a long time ago. And he says, some of you have gotten sick and even died because of it. So it might be implied that Paul's thinking that sickness and death is God's judgment, maybe. But if that's true, then it's the other place, maybe. But this seems to be the only place in the New Testament. So we don't see this in other churches in the New Testament, not to mention today. We don't see this condemnation over it. But what we do see repeatedly through all the churches is that righteous behavior, the demand for doing it right and telling truth and being transparent is absolutely not unique. And this is the part that becomes so di- It's funny, the other part was difficult. This is the real difficult part when it comes to teaching the Bible. For me, it is. This heavy emphasis on the New Testament on not sinning. There's a funny meme that went around a while back ago. There's this preacher and he says, preaching a lifetime of sermon in 12 seconds. And he gets up there and he has his robe on. He goes, stop sinning. Amen. He walks off. Of course, the gospel is more than that. But there's some truth to that when you read the New Testament, how much it's emphatically against sin. So much so, I wonder today, I did wonder this through the week. I told Ben at one point, I said, man, I'm really pondering about this. How many people of us would die? You don't have to, but raise your hand. Right, <laughs> don't have to. Well, how many of us in the Hill Church would die if God chose to judge us based on this overt, deliberate sense to try to sin in our lives, to just feel over dead? I mean, would our pews be empty, our chairs be empty like this picture? I wonder in a different way. Is God's spirit really fully welcome to rule in you? If he is, here's your hint. When the spirit comes, the first thing that has to go is sin. Now, why is that? We'll see in a second. That, well, I'll talk more, but because he already said this. Why has Satan filled your heart? There is one being that loves the fact that you and I sin. And we have that character as different names in the Bible. Satan, the devil, he loves it. Is the spirit fully welcome in you? I love various aspects of the Pentecostal tradition. I love the fact that they spend so much energy on making sure we're using the gifts of the spirit. First Corinthians 12, Romans 12, I love that. And several features about that uh, tradition in Christianity. One thing I don't like about the tradition that my brothers and sisters in Christ, I've told them this, is this, this tendency to view that when the Spirit is active, it means I'm doing a lot more dancing and hollering and I'm slaying the Spirit. That is to say it emphasizes the Spirit's activity as being manifested, being happy, 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 happy. You can feel the Spirit, so you get happy. So joy, woo! And then you read the Bible. And the Bible, when the Spirit shows up, typically there's terrible conviction of sin. And we experience this as Christians a lot. If you really are a Christian, Maybe if not, I'm a Christian, because I've met, i been in this game a long time. My personal life, this happens. This absolutely happens in my life. Absolutely, it's happened. All my Christian life, it's happened to know people. They'll be singing a praise song, and all of a sudden, the sin is brought up in your mind. I need to stop that. <laughs> Amazing grace. I need to stop that. Or you're sitting there, the Bible verse comes up, and all of a sudden, this, that's the Spirit gently convicting us of sin, exactly what Paul said, but Jesus said what happened in John. That's the conviction of sin. And I told, I told my kids, it took my, the day I was talking to my son about this, it's one of the greatest difficulties of Christian theology, like two blades of a scissors. You've heard me say this before. On the one hand, the New Testament keeps sin very seriously. It takes it very seriously. Jesus died for this. Romans 6, how many of you have died? You can go back. You have died. For, it's over. On the other blade of scissors is grace. Oh my goodness, glorious, amazing grace. And if you take out one blade, that's usually one whole denomination. Tell the other great, it's one whole. That's all we preach here. That's all we preach here. No, the Bible's both. Yeah. Well, I take sin and I take grace seriously. And as soon as I talk about sin, people get mad because you, David, you didn't mention, I used to have to be out of church. A guy sent me a letter, a card. He took the time to write a card about how much he couldn't stand my sermon because in the sermon, I was talking about the Ten Commandments and the context, and I didn't use the word grace the whole time. Took the time to write a letter. So they about, other people to grace, Dave, you don't talk about sin enough. And I, I appreciate that. I understand it. But it depends on the context. And here, there's not mention of grace. This is not a con, this is not a narrative. This is the narrative of God's absolute total demand for righteous behavior. Is the Spirit fully welcome here, or is this just a show? 
I really mean that. This is a thing where you show up to Hill Church, and I don't get show up, all right? We're just still church where they come out, we're at Walmart. But I'm talking about, when we gather here together, oh, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, please show up. Do you really mean that? What if it, what if it really meant that the Spirit showed up in your life, that it meant you had to instantaneously give up every single addiction you had, every single temptation you had to get strength for and accountability for, people in this room you know for a fact you've sinned against, you go and kneel in front of them and beg for forgiveness? Would you real, oh, Lord, you please, Spirit, show up for someone else? Or as long as you're going to make me happy. But see, we, we do this a lot, and I, I get it. I, mean, I say we. Spirit, please show them, show up as long as you give me victory over. And that's what sells. I know how to write books that sell. We could pack out this. We could pack out the place, man, every week. Oh, no, 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 about victory, 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 victory in Jesus. And we could say how he's going to rescue you and rescue you. Because that way, God's a genie. And the Spirit is there to make sure all you do is conquer everything in life. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't say, I come to make sure you conquer everything. He said, you got to deny your will, pick up a cross, and follow me. It's your way or my way. We don't want your way or the highway. Who do you think you are, Jesus? And we have to decide. And this story is just one example of many where they took sin so seriously, God was trying to get the point across. Would you take sin this seriously? How many of us will be left over in the chair? If we said, Spirit, come. David, you're preaching sinless perfection. I'm not. I'm not making any of this stuff up. I don't know if I'd be killed. It haunts me. It haunts me all the time. Lord Jesus, please, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry. Is there anything else I don't know about? I'm not obsessive about it, but I take it seriously. How many of us would die? Satan loves that. He picks the tiniest little temptations and pushes and pushes and fuels and go, oh, it feels good, done. Oh, yeah, you deserve that. You worked hard. Look, oh, no one's going to know the difference. You're not hurting anybody. All the stupid stuff Satan says, and he jumps on opportunity, ah, and then he can't wait for you to be embarrassed. And so as soon as you make up that, that you don't just make a mistake, as soon as you sin, and I, oh, no, I can't tell anybody, I can't tell anybody. He's like, I got him. I got him. I got him. If I can get a Christian to give him a temptation, and to sin and not tell anybody for help and encouragement, she's mine. Watch this, demons. Watch this. It's called a slow fade. Yeah, baby. There's another one. Got her on that one. Got her on that one. Then that's it. There she's out of church. Good. Praise. Woo. Praise Satan. Boom. It's a slow fade. It's a slow, slow, gradual fade of giving into sin. We're delusional if we don't think this happens. It happens. I've seen it on my entire personal career. Satan deliberately tried to stop Jesus directly, Luke 4. He deliberately, directly tried to stop him by tempt Jesus. That didn't work. Then he tempts Judas. He tries to stop Jesus through Judas, one of his apostles that he called, that Jesus deliberately asked, come be on my board. Satan used him to try to stop Jesus. Almost worked, didn't work. Then, after that didn't work, he tries to see, stop Jesus' apostle, Peter. It's in Luke 22. You're going to deny me. You're going to deny me. And now Satan's trying to top, stop Jesus' community. Satan tempts you and me, many things, but here in the text, to deceive, to be fake, to love things more than the kingdom of God. We have an enemy. We have an enemy. No, my enemy's Biden or Trump. Or, no. Are you kidding me? You think the greatest struggle for you in life is what they're doing? I have a thousand miles of... My taxes are my greatest enemy. My ex-spouse, no, they're not. That pastor, they, my teenager, that's not your greatest enemy. It is so, it's a brilliant marketing campaign for Satan to get us so deluded to think that we deserve it, or this, 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 and the real problem is out there. The real problem's out there. If we can just focus on them and get mad all the time, oh, here we go, you've got us. And that's, I think that's Luke trying to make the point here in Sapphira. I love the question. I'll move on. Why did you let this happen? Why did you let Satan fill your heart to make this decision? I wish you wouldn't have done that. You had a good thing going. We were here for you as a church. And in I Sapphira, you could have talk. We love you. We'd have given grace. We're here for you. You are not alone. Why did you do this? Why did you see us and think we're a bunch? Why, you think we can be duped? I mean, well, the spirit got duped. He can't be fooled. He can't be tricked. He can't be tricked. People hear about what happened. And in verse 12, stay with me, we're almost done. Now, 
So they preach boldly, verse 12, and now says the other answer to the prayer request happens. Many signs and wonders were done among the people by the hands of the prophets. So, and this happens around the world today. This isn't just an ancient thing, it is today. Not just amongst missionaries, though it happens there too. Around the world, God does amazing things through his people, through the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico. Solomon's portico is on the picture. It's this long part of the Temple Mount. So they're right there doing all this incredible stuff in front of the Jewish leadership. The same spot where they said, stop doing that. Shut up. Stop talking about Jesus. Uh Uh-huh, sure thing. Okay, we'll keep preaching gospel. I mean, they didn't give a rip. It's like talking about the downflow of the government in D.C. right from the White House. I mean, they didn't care. They They were bold. This all happened right in the power. Now, none of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high honor. He probably means people who'd weren't fully committed. People like Ananias Sapphira, who saw the church, like, I kind of want to be a part of that, but the kind of charlatans. They's like, that ain't going to work. And, and verse 14, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes, men and women, they even carried out the sick to the streets. They laid them on beds and pallets. And as Peter came by, even if his shadow could just fall on them, people in the ancient world thought shadows were part of the person. Even if a shadow just touched them, they could be healed. That's how much God worked through these people. The people also got up from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with the unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Illnesses, demon possession, healed, 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 healed. The uncommitted refused to join the Christian community, but the genuine believers increased. I wonder, what do you think the church is here for? Really, what do you think? Of, I mean, you don't have to answer. I know, you know that's, but what do you think the church is here for? What do you think makes God more happy? Peter Lord gave this analogy 40 years ago. It's a fantastic. What do you think, like, you know, I, I showed you a picture back on Resurrection Sunday that this right here was a parking lot full of old Model T's. You remember that picture when we was here? Model T's car, because across the street with the insurance was there's a car dealership. So Model T cars. What will make Henry Ford more happy? What will make Henry Ford more happy? Comes with a lot. There's a thousand broken wrecks. Hooray, there's all my cars. Or would it be 10, Henry, 10 Model T's that work right? Really? It's a mega lot. Look at all the Model T's. And it's a decrepit old lot full of broken down. Whoa! What would make Elon Musk happier? A bunch of Teslas totally destroyed, not functioning. And one that worked the way he designed it. I mean, it's not a hard, I mean, you think about it. What do you think, of God's, what do you think of makes him more happy? Mega church is full of people who are not committed to him at all. And if they, ha- if God were to judge people to boom, boom, left and right, boom, 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 or a group of just one, two, three people is like, Lord Jesus, you have all. Holy Spirit, I want sin out of my life. I don't want anything to do with it. And you've told me repeatedly what it is. I'm going to say, stop. Nope. I'm going to get accountability. It's over. I want to know. I want to be a genuine believer. I want to be the kind of person to whom you can work these mighty acts and signs. I want to be the kind of person who leaves this room on Sundays is not just living for the weekend all over again or living for that drink or living for that porn or living for that whatever, that weed, that meth, living for the, to, the prestige, living for retirement, living for the golf course. I don't want to do, Lord Jesus, no. I want to be known as part of a people that are so weird for good reasons that I constantly think of how can I get boldly, boldly get you to understand who Jesus is, the resurrection, and God, use me. Use me through signs and wonders and works. I don't care if it's at Bex. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm prepared to look like an absolute fool because I'm committed. Okay. I wonder. I, I don't want to be a church full of wrecks. David, but we all are. I agree. I mm-hmm. am too. I'm not a fully functional Model T. That's pretty old, too. Some of you are that old. I won't point people out. But he's not awake. He can't hear me anyway. I just... Some of us are super old. I know. I get it. I get it. But I do know this is, as a Christian, I don't want to give up before I started. And that's what a lot of us do. Well, I can never be. So let's go do it. I don't tend to be a way to follow Jesus. I'll never be a perfect husband. I'll get married. Let's go cheat on her right now. I mean, who does that? I don't do that for Jesus. I don't have my spouse. I don't think we ought to either. So I want to, I want to pray. I'm going to do a little different this morning, differently. I'm going to skip ahead to the next one here, Tim. 
I'm going to encourage you as I do every single week, and you don't have to. There's nothing magical about this wood and carpet up here. But I'm going to encourage you to come forward, anybody. If there's a known sin in your life that you know you should not be doing, you struggle with that, I encourage you. You don't have to. It's not magic. But I encourage you to come forward. Kneel before this. Pretend for a second you're before God Almighty. And you're going to confess that sin to Him. To Him. No one else needs to know it. Your spouse party already knows it. But if you want to confess it to someone, I'll be up here. I'm happy. I'd be a safe spot. Not fine. Confess it just to God. God, take this sin away from me. Maybe you don't know Jesus and you want to know him this morning. Let me pray for you. Uh, whatever you've got in your heart and mind, let's pray for a few minutes. And I'll, I'll close this in prayer after a few minutes of that. If you feel someone's hand on your shoulder, they're just praying for you. That's all they're doing. Let's pray together.